Hey, this is Christians Wake Up, and today I'm going to be talking about the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren. Now, we had just gone over a um, message about uh, Satan, Azazel, and a serpent, and this message goes along with that message because there's more information um, about Satan and one of his operations that he does. So we want to make sure that we cover everything about the enemy uh, that we have and that we know about or that we thought that we knew about, but make sure that we understand his nature, make sure that we understand his position and make sure we understand what he actually does. So this one is called the accuser of the brethren because the Bible talks about him actually accusing the brethren. And when it talks about the brethren, it's talking about Israel, uh, the Hebrews. So we're going to go through scripture because remember, scripture reigns out of the mouth of two or three witness. Let every word be established. And we're going to do this line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. So let's find out first about Satan being the accuser of the brethren. Now, one thing that we do know is that Satan had been the accuser of the brethren all the way back in the book of Job. And we're going to go there right now to Job chapter one and start reading there. Let's go ahead and go there now. Uh, Job chapter one, verse six. Here's what it says. It says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan came also among them. Uh, verse seven, and Yahweh said unto Satan, whence comest thou? Then Satan answered Yahweh and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down it, because he was trying to see who he could devour. And I'm going to prove this as well. We're going to actually, because it's always truth, especially in a lot of the translations, they like to add a little bit more truth and a little bit more of um, how we would say things in our days. So I'm going to go to the message Bible on this one and look at what it says right here. Verse six, it says, one day when the angels came to report to God or Elohim, Satan, who was the designated accuser. So I just want to stop there. He is the designated accuser, the accuser of the brethren. That's one of his titles, the designated accuser or the accuser of the brethren. It says he came along with them, with the angels. Alahayim singled out Satan and said, what have you been up to? Satan answered Alahayim saying, going here and there, checking things out on earth. So we know the whole story about Job, but I just want to show you that he was even trying to accuse Job. Now, remember, Job was an upright man, perfect in all his ways. Um, Job had some bad kids who were doing other things, but Job was perfect and upright. So the thing was, is that he wanted to accuse Job of, over his kids. But that's how he is the accuser, because he accuses the brethren. He accuses those who live their lives in righteousness. Um, there's another scenario, actually, in the book of Jasher where he does the same thing. And most people don't know this unless you read the Apocrypha, which I absolutely 100 uh, percent recommend that you read the Apocrypha, uh, the book of Jasher or Yasher um, in there. He actually does the same thing to Abraham. Um, it's not in the King James version. And this is where the whole story of Isaac, when uh, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, there was a reason why the Most High was uh, asking Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Let's just go there right now. It's Jasher uh, 22, verse 46. And I'm just going to scroll over here to it right here. I have it in PDF form right now, and it's already highlighted for me. So Jasher 22, 46, he accuses Abraham. Watch this. It says, 
And the day arrived when the sons of God or the sons of El- Elohim came and placed themselves before Yahweh. And Satan also came with the sons of Elohim or Elohim before Yahweh. And Yahweh said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered Yahweh and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And Yahweh said to Satan, What is thy word to me concerning all the children of the earth? And Satan answered Yahweh and said, I have seen all the children of the earth who serve thee and and remember thee when they require anything from thee. See, already he's he's going about seeking whom he may devour. That's why he said uh, he comes seeking who he may devour. The thief cometh to uh, not but for to kill, steal and destroy. So he's just going up and down the earth, just trying to find his perfect target like a lion. Verse 49. And when thou givest them the thing which they require from thee, they sit at their ease and forsake thee, and they remember thee no more. Right here, verse 50. Let me scroll up here. So here's what Yahweh says, verse 50. Has thou seen Abraham, the son of Terah, who at first had no children, and he served thee and erected altars to thee whenever he came? And he brought up offerings upon them and he proclaimed thy name continually to all the children of the earth. And now that his son Isaac is born to him, he has forgotten me. He has made a great feast for all the inhabitants of the land and Yahweh. Oh, he has forgotten. So here's Satan accusing uh, Abraham right now. Verse 52. Listen to this. For amidst all that he has done, he brought thee no offering, neither burnt offering, nor peace offering, neither nox, lamb, nor goat of all that he killed on the day that his son was weaned. Even from the time of his birth, of his son's birth till now, being 37 years, so Isaac was 37 years old, he built no altar before thee nor brought any offering to thee. For he saw that thou didst give what he requested before thee. And he therefore forsook thee. So Satan is landed on hard to the most high. I mean, he's landed on hard, accusing the brethren, accusing Abraham of doing something and, and, and not caring for the most high. So we go to, let me scroll over to the next uh, chapter or the next uh, set of verses right here. It says, and Yahweh said to Satan, has thou thus considered my servant Abraham? For there is none like him upon earth, a perfect and an upright man before me. One that feareth Elohim, feareth him and avoideth evil. As I live, were I to say unto him, Bring up Isaac, thy son, before me. He would not withhold him from me. Much more if I told him to bring up a burnt offering before me from his flocks or herd. So Yahweh right here is saying, look, Moses is the most upright, perfect man on this earth. If I'd asked him to bring Isaac to me, he's going to he'll bring him to me and sacrifice him. The same as if I told him, hey, just bring me a burnt offering. He would do it. Verse 55, and Satan answered Yahweh and said, speak then now unto Abraham as thou hast said, and thou wilt see whether he will not this day transgress and cast aside thy words. The accuser of the brethren, we see him accusing our forefather, Abraham, right here. So this just proves even further, that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Now, what most people don't know is Satan also accused the Messiah. And he's actually in the Old Testament. I I believe I showed this before in a video, but his name in the Old Testament was the name Joshua. Now, we know that Joshua that was with um, Moses 
and who led the children of Israel into the promised land the same way that Yahawashai, which by the way, and we're just, let's just go to the scripture. Let's go to it. Um, yeah, let's go to it. Let me go back to here. Let's go to Zechariah uh, verse or chapter three, verse one. Right here. We're just going to read this first part. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, keyword high priest. Standing before the angel of Yahweh and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Now, most people are like, no, this is Joshua, the, the, the one that led it. No, let me listen. Let's click on Strong's. Joshua is where you get the word. If you're saying it in Aramaic and I'll use Aramaic right now. Yahushua. Joshua is Yahushua. And the meaning of his name is right here. Jehovah save or Yahweh save or Yahweh saves or Yahweh is salvation right here. Yahweh or Yahuwah, whichever one you want to use is salvation. He is salvation. That is his name. As a matter of fact, let me even prove it further because that's actually that his that's this is his name. Let me go, let me just do this. Uh, let me show you. I don't know if I've ever shown you this before. Salvation. Um, no, I don't want it in the New Testament. Let me give it an old testament. Genesis, let's look at this one right here. Genesis 49. Uh, 18 right here, this scripture, 49, 18. I have waited for thy salvation, O Yahweh. Let me show you what the word salvation is. Same word that, that people say today, Yeshua, which is salvation. That's the name. And what's the, what's, what is it right here? Something saved. That's the reason why we call him Yahushua. Um, I'll use Aramaic right now because most people don't do paleo. So Yahushua, that's why people say Yahushua and Yahuwah. But Yahushua is Yah is salvation or Yah saves. So just wanted to let you know, just for that word salvation, just so you can, you can always know that when you say salvation, you're calling out the Savior's name uh, in Aramaic, Yeshua. I would say Yahawashi. So back to Zechariah chapter three, here is your Joshua or your Yahshua. <laughs> Get that. See how they play with that, that English language? Joshua, Yahshua. That's how they play you with the English language. But right here again, let's just read it. And he showed me Joshua or Yahshua, the high priest standing before the angel of Yahweh. And Satan standing at his right hands to resist him. That word resist right there. Oppose. But I'm going to show you also when I click on the strongs. That word resist is the word accuse. The accuser of the brethren. Uh, we can even look at it in. Let's see. Um, let's look at it in the NIV. Right here. It says, then he showed me Joshua or Yahshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of Yahweh and Satan, standing at his right side to accuse him, to accuse him. So once again, we have the accuser of the brethren. Now, I said all of this because I just wanted to make sure that you understood who the true accuser was. So we got that Satan is the accuser of the brothers, but did you know that Satan has two representatives? He actually has two representatives. And here's where this journey gets very interesting. And the reason why I even did this message, the accuser of the brethren. I'm going to go to the pseudopicrypho. So now we're going to the Old Testament pseudopicrypho, uh, volume one. 
Let me uh, get to it. I'm going to have to get out of here real quick. Bear with me. So I'm going to go to the Pseudopigrapha Volume 1. And I'm going to go to... Let's see what page. 281. Okay, I see it now. 281. Oh, do this like this. Okay, there we go. Let me just get this in here. Okay, now this section is, this is in the book of Enoch 3, and I wanted to read this about you. Now, I'm going to have to explain um, some things because it's talking about where we're going to right now. It's talking about ser uh, seraphim, and it's talking about the angel who's over the seraphim. So I'll just read it, and then we can interject. So where it starts in yellow at the top, Serapiel, which is, you know, L means of God. Serapiel is the name of that prince and the name of the crown on his head is Prince of Peace. Now, he's not the Prince of Peace as far as the savior like that, but he is the Prince of Peace in this realm he's in. Why is his name called Serapiel? Because he is in charge of the seraphim. Now, we've heard the seraphim in the King James Version, so we know that the seraphim are real. Let's get the reading. And the seraphim of flame. Just remember that the seraphim of flame are committed to his care. He stands over them day and night and teaches them song, psalm, eulogy, might, and majesty, so that they might glorify their king with all manner of praise and sanctifying song. So that's this is what Serapiel, his position is, to make sure that the seraphim are safe and teaches them all these different things so they can uh, glorify the king. We know who the king is, the king of kings. Uh, right here at nine, it says, how many seraphim are there? Four, corresponding to the four winds of the world. Now, I want to show you that um, they they do, is like it says right here, it says that they correspond to the four wings of the world. Let me just go to, uh, it's in Revelations. Um, in Revelations, let me see, wind. Let's put the word wind and find it. Um, right here. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Revelation seven right here. It says, and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. Same thing we just read in third Enoch, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now, remember what I told you about um, their attribute, how it said there were uh, angels of fire. Watch this. Let's, verse two says, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living Elohim. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and sea. Now, what was their attributes? Fire. Okay. Verse three saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our Elohim in, uh, in their foreheads. Now, go to verse or chapter eight. And let me see if I can even find it real quick. I believe it's in here. Oh, right here. Verse seven. Look, yeah, verse seven. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. What did it say right here? Back here in seven uh, verse. Three, it says, oh, no, no, let's verse one. It says, and after all these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea or on the tree. Uh, actually, yeah, it was uh, three saying hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our Elohim in their foreheads. That verse three right there said, don't hurt the earth, the sea, nor the trees. We go over here in chapter eight. What did the first angel do? It says the first angel sounded and there followed hell and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. So he started, the angel started hurting the earth. Which angel was that? It was a seraphim. 
because it said the uh, in verse the we, what we just got through reading in verse or chapter seven, the angel told them, "Don't hurt the earth till his servants are sealed." Then in, in Revelation chapter eight, now we see this first angel starting to hurt the earth. And actually, if, if you read the next verse, verse eight, and the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood. So now we see these angels, these seraphims starting to hurt the earth. So I just wanted to just show that, that it matched up with what um, Enoch chapter three or third Enoch, sorry, uh, with Enoch three, what it says that these are the, in, in fact, the exact same angels that's starting to hurt the earth. So now let's go back to Enoch. So now we have an understanding of what position they have. And there's actually even more. We're going to go to, let's, uh, let's read at nine again, where it says nine. Okay. It says, how many seraphim are there? Four corresponding to the four winds of the world. How many wings have each of them? Six, according to the six days of creation. How many faces? And just to let you know with that six wings, that's in the Old Testament too, when I think uh, Ezekiel saw them and they had six wings, the seraphim showed themselves. Let's get the reading. How many faces have they? 16, four facing in each direction. The measure of the seraphim are the height of each of them corresponds to the seven heavens. There are seven heavens. The size of each wing is as the fullness of a heaven. These things are huge. And the size of each face is like the rising sun. Each of them radiates light like the splendor of the throne of glory. So that even the holy creatures, the majestic Ophanim, which is another type of angel, and the glorious cherubim, which are another type of angel, cannot look on that light for the eyes of anyone who looks on it grow dim from its great brilliance. Now, you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with the accuser of the brethren? Why are we reading about the seraphim? We were just talking about Satan accusing the brethren and different things like that. And we just got through reading about that. Why are we reading about seraphim? It seemed like I'm kind of going off topic. No, I'm not going off topic because let's read this next part. I'll scroll right here. It says, why is their name called seraphim? Because they burn the tablets of Satan. Every day, Satan sits with Samael. Now, remember, we talked about Samael. Now, and actually, in my message, Samael, I said Samael and Satan were the exact same person. They are not. They are not. And there was confusion in the scriptures, in, in this uh, Old Testament pseudo-epigrapha, making Samuel seem as though he was Satan and making Satan seem as though he was Samuel. They operate almost like Father, Son, Holy Spirit are one. This is how they operate. Look at this. Every day, Satan sits with Samael, prince of Rome, prince of Rome. Remember we read who Mystery Babylon was? It talked about them having uh, scarlet and red, golden cup in her hand. Who's in Rome? I've been to Rome. I've been to the place. I've been to the seat where Satan sits. I've traveled there on vacation. I've been to the seven mountains. I've seen it myself. Prince of Rome, Samael. But look at this. So remember, remember I said Satan has two representatives, Samael, Prince of Rome, and with Dubael, Prince of Persia. Doesn't his name, remember I told you, L's, look at Samael's. Samael means, that L at the end means of, Elohim or of God, if you say it in modern uh, day. So then his name would be Sami of God. Look at Dubai's name. Take off the L and what name do you have? Dubai. Doesn't that ring a bell? 
The city that we know called Dubai that was built over in the Persian Gulf. Just wanted to throw that out. We might have to investigate that a little further, but we're not going to concentrate on that. But I just wanted to I just thought it was real interesting that his name is Dubai El and we have a uh, he's the prince of Persia. And then we have a city called Dubai in the Persian Gulf. They're just just a sad journey. So let's get to reading. So Samael, prince of Rome and Dubai El, prince of Persia. And they write down the sins of Israel on tablets. And give them to the seraphim. Now, here's where the seraphim come in. Here, I'm telling you, it's not a side journey. They give them to the seraphim to bring them before the holy one. Remember, we read in Job 1.6, it said the sons of God, which are the angels, which are the seraphim, came before the most high and Satan came in with them. So now Satan is, is getting even more sinister, and he's writing down on tablets him, Samael, and Dubael to bring accusations against Israel. Right here, the seraphim to bring before the Holy One, blessed be he, so that he should destroy Israel from the world. But the seraphim know the secrets of the Holy One, blessed be he, that he does not desire that this nation, Israel, should fall. Remember in the scriptures in the Old Testament, it said, ye sons are, uh, oh, how, how does it go? Ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Um, oh man, I need to go to it real quick. Let's see, Jacob consume. Cause I'm forgetting how the scripture goes. Um, Yep, right here, Malachi 3, 6. It says, for I am Yahweh, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Why are they not consumed? Because he made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that their seed would last forever. So in all of Israel's sin and all of our sin, which we should not be sinning on purpose, but in all of the sin that we've done throughout the ages, throughout each generation, as much as Yahweh gets ticked off as, at us and wants to utterly sometimes destroy us because of our blatant sin against him, he says, for I am Yahweh, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So he won't consume us because he won't break his promise. But then we have up here, we had this dude, Satan. Right here, I'm going to start where everyday Satan sits with Samael, prince of Rome, and with Dubael, prince of Persia. And they write down the sins of Israel on tablets and give them to the seraphim to bring them before the Holy One, blessed be he, so that he should destroy Israel from the world. See, it's deeper than just trying to destroy Israel from the world. Do you realize what he's really trying to do? Not, he's, trying to, he's trying to double dip. Not only does he want to destroy Israel from the world, he wants to turn the Most High into a liar. Because if he destroys Israel from the world, that means the Most High didn't keep his promise. And remember, the scripture says if his if his promises don't come to pass, he no longer is the Most High. Satan's still trying to rise up above the Most High by getting him to break his promise that he promised himself to Israel. This dude is crazy. 100% crazy. He cray cray. Okay. So let's go down. <laughs> it says, what then? Right here. What then? Let me just highlight it just so you can see. We're going to start. Nope. Below here. Oh, I'm not trying to do that. At that right here where it says what? What then do the seraphim do? So what do they do with these tablets that uh, Satan gives him? Satan, Samuel, and Dubai do? Every day. They take the tablets from Satan's hand and burn them in the blazing fire that stands opposite the high, opposite the high and exalted throne. So that they should not come into the presence of the Holy One. So, so it shows that Satan is still up there because they are before the throne. But it says so that he won't come because they stand opposite 
the high and exalted throne and, and Satan hands them the tablets and it says they burn them up so that they should not come into the presence of the Holy One. Blessed be he when he sits upon the throne of judgment and judges the whole world in truth. So that's the reason why I showed you who Satan was, who the seraphim was, what their position was, so that you can understand what Satan, Samuel, who is Prince of Rome, and Dubael, Prince of Persia, what they do every day against Israel, not Christians, not Christians, against Israel, because Satan has beef with Israel. <sighs> well, let's get into the Christian thing. We might as well go ahead and get into the Christian thing right now. So I'm going to turn to another chapter in this pseudo Pickerfoot and show you the universal rule of Rome. Since we know now that Samael is the prince of Rome. So let's go to uh, page 363. Oh. Went too far. Hold on. I can just fast forward. Let's see. 363, right here. So let's read about this universal rule of Rome from the Sibylline Oracles in the Old Testament Pseudopicrypha. So this is page 363. If you want to read it, uh, you can get the um you can get the PDF from my website, ChristiansWakeUp.tv, and follow along. So let's go right here. Universal rule of Rome, followed by eschatological destruction. So this was a, a prophecy of Rome. It says, but when Rome will also rule over Egypt, guiding it toward a single goal, then indeed the most great kingdom of the immortal king will become manifest over men. For a holy prince will come to gain sway over the scepters of the earth forever as time presses on. Now, just letting you know, this is not the holy one. This says the holy prince. Then also, impl implacable wrath will fall upon Latin men who are Romans. Three will destroy Rome with pietous fate. All men will perish in their own dwellings. When the fiery cataract flows from heaven, that's when that destruction is coming. Alas, wretched one, when will that day come? And the judgment of the great king, see, that's the great king now, immortal God or Allah. Yet, just for the present, be founded cities and all be embellished with temples and stadia markets and gold and silver and stone statues so that you may come to the bitter day. Who did he just describe? What place did he just describe? He just described Rome, the Vatican. Uh, verse 60, for it will come when the men of, when the smell of, of brimstone spreads among all men. But I will tell all in turn and how many cities mortals will endure. Now I'm gonna get through reading this because this is gonna make even more sense. The advent of Beliar, which that word Beliar, Beliar, liar, Bel the liar. So look, then Beliar will come from Sebastinos. Now we got Belear, which is Baal, <laughs> the liar, Baal, Baal. And he will raise up the height of mountains. He will raise up the sea, the great fiery sun and shiny moon. And he will raise up the dead and perform many signs for men, but they will not be effective in him. But he will indeed also lead men astray. This is the great deceiver. And he will lead astray many faithful chosen Hebrews, the accuser of the brethren. His whole job is to lead astray 
the chosen, the accuser. See, the chosen Hebrews. That's why I said it's not the Christians. It's the chosen Hebrews. He's trying to eradicate them because of the promise the Most High has for Israel. Many faithful chosen Hebrews and also other lawless men. So he's making a separation between Hebrews and lawless men who have not yet listened to the word of Yahweh or Allahim. That's the reason I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to try to teach you or at least try to show you all these things that have been hidden that I've been finding because I don't want you to be without his word and knowing that this stuff is going to happen. At least you're informed. Uh, let's get to reading uh, 70 who have not yet li listened to the word of Allah. Hayim. But whenever the threat of the uh, the threats of the great God or great Allah Hayim draw nigh and a burning power comes through the sea to land. <laughs> actually, that I just put that together. I can put that together right there with. Remember, we read in uh, not in this one, but in Baruch, how he was going to come that Baruch saw this uh, mountain like it was cut off in the sea and someone riding on it and the armies of the world came against him and he opened his mouth and burnt them with fire. Look at what it says right here. But whenever the threats of the great Elohim draw nigh and a burning power comes through the sea to land. So it lines right up with what Baruch said. Just look at my other uh, earlier messages. It's in the uh, fourth B series. And it talks about him coming on the sea, burning them up and coming to land. It will also burn Beliar, Beliar, Baal, the liar, and all overbearing men, as many as put faith in him. In who? In Beliar. Baal the liar. Now, I like saying that way. Baal, Baal the liar. So now we got that. There's more I want to read because we're getting, we still on the accuser of the brethren. I want to read about this cosmic destruction right here in the reign of Cleopatra. You'll understand why I'm reading it. Then indeed the world will be governed under the hands of a woman. So just remember woman that is going to be governed by the hands of a woman and be obedient in everything. So everybody's going to be obedient to this woman. Then when a widow reigns over the world, hold on. So now a widow is going to reign over the world. So we got a woman, people going to be obedient to this woman, but not only is she a woman, she's a widow who reigns over the world. You're like, what? What widow woman going to reign over the world? I'm going to show you. And throws gold and silver into the wondrous brine and casts the bronze and iron of ephemeral men, ooh, effeminate men, woo, into the sea. Then all the elements of the universe will be bereft when Yahweh or Elohim who dwells in the sky, rolls up. That dude going to roll up the heaven as a scroll is rolled. Just to let you know when he, that's why, I, oh man, I'm going to do a whole series on this, the the dimensions of the earth, because y'all keep believing what es, uh, Edom, Esau says that it's a, a globe and circular. When the Bible says, it's oh, I'm just in the King James version alone, it's over 100 scriptures I can go to right now and tear this whole globe crap up that Edom has said. Oh, yeah, this, man, I can tear it up through the scriptures and I can oh, probably over two to three hundred when I add all the other books. But let's keep going. I just get pissed off at that. They have lied about the dimensions of his earth and people going to be jacked up when he rolls it, when the actual sky rolls like a scroll and realize that the earth ain't been round. It's exactly the way he said it in the word. But anyway, let's go. Verse 80 again. Actually, let's just start from the top and cast the bronze and the eye uh, and iron of ephemeral men into the sea. Then all the elements of the universe will be bereft when Elohim, who dwells in the sky, rolls up the heaven as a scroll, like he said he was going to do, is rolled. 
and the whole variegated vault, 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 vault of heaven. Because the Bibles all used to say that it's a vault. We live in a vault because we do. Nobody ain't getting off this earth. There's no spaceship. Yeah, it's always pointed toward the Bermuda Triangle. And I know because I live in Florida and I see them launches all the time. OK. Um, and the whole world variegated vault of heaven falls on the wondrous earth and ocean. An undying cataract of raging fire will flow and burn earth, burn sea and melt the heavenly vault. And days in creation itself into one and separate and separate them into clear air. There will no longer be twinkling spheres of luminaries because the stars aren't planets. They are luminaries that twinkle, that have their own light and not um, big gaseous balls like they say. Uh, there will be no night, no dawn, no numerous days of care, no spring, no summer, no winter, no autumn. And then indeed the judgment of the great Elohim will come into the midst of the great world when all these things happen. Now we see that all of this event happens during the time frame, the time frame of Cleopatra, the woman. Then indeed the world will be governed under the hands of a woman and be obedient in everything. Then when a widow reigns over the whole world. So we got that widow again and throws gold and silver into the wonders brine. So I'm going to just stop right there because I'm, I'm going to go to this last part of the accuser of the brethren. So we see this woman and she's a widow and everybody's obedient to this woman and she reigns over the whole world. And some might some might have already figured this out. Some might have uh, have not. Who is this woman? Let's go to Revelations 18. Let's go right to Revelations in the last book, Revelations 18. Let's start at verse four. Here's your woman right here. Verse four. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her. Remember that woman? The, 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 the widow? It says, come out of her, my People lining right up with the, the whole Hebrew thing that it says come out of her, my people, Hebrews and and listen and other other um, Gentiles too, y'all better come out of her so you won't receive her plagues that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not her plagues for her sins have reached unto heaven talking about this. Spiritual Cleopatra woman. And Yahweh hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even, well, excuse me, reward her even as she rewarded you. Wow. Now I'm going to read that. I'm, I'm, I wasn't going to go to this scripture, but I'm going I'm to have one more after this. Reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her, double according to her works in the cup, which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified, talking about this woman, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. She lived so luxuriously, so much torment and sorrow give her for she saith in her heart. I sit a queen. Well, Cleopatra was a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. So here we have the woman who sits as a queen as Cleopatra did. She says she ain't no widow, but we go right back over here. And it says, then when a widow reigns over the world, because she is a widow, but she keep boasting, saying, I sit a queen right here. I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Uh, uh, uh. Let's get to reading about her. Let's get to reading about this woman. 
how much, verse seven, how much she have glorified herself and de uh, lived deliciously. I'm just reading this over again. So much torment and sorrow give her for she hath said in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day. One day, listen, going back here, let's see the plagues coming one day, right here, back in the Sibylline Oracles. Um, let's start right here, where it says, then. Then all the elements of the universe will be bereft when Elohim, who dwells in the sky, rolls up the heaven as a scroll is rolled and the whole variegated vault of heaven falls on the wondrous earth and ocean. An undying cataract of raging fire will flow and burn earth, burn sea and melt the heavenly vault and days and creation itself into one and separate them into clear air. There will no longer be twinkling spheres of luminaries, no night, no dawn, no numerous days of care, no spring, no summer, no winter, no autumn. Indeed. And then indeed, the judgment of the great Elohim will come into the midst of the great world when all these things will happen one day. This is a one day destruction of this uh, woman who think that she sits a queen and the woman who reigns over the world and is a widow and lives delicately, luxuriously with all this gold and silver. One day. So, verse nine, and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously or luxuriously with her shall bewail her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Rome. Verse 10. So we know who this is. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon. See, this is that mystery Babylon, mother of harlots. That mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth her merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver, we just read about that in the Sibylline Oracles. Gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thyme wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and a brass and a mar iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves. Slaves and souls of men. So mystery Babylon. But see, this mystery Babylon is also, remember who Samuel is, prince of Rome. Now, Romans have taken out their names, out of, especially out of the Old Testament. But if you go to the oldest Old Testament in the world, it is the Septuagint LXX. And it was written by 72 of the tribes of Israel, 12 from each, or what is it? Uh, six from each tribe, I believe. Either six, let's see, 12, 24, 36, 48, 12, 24, 36, 48, 60, 72, six, six members. There we go. Six from each tribe. So Septuagint LXX, 72 transcribed them by King Ptolemy. He had six from each tribe go in separate rooms and transcribe the Old Testament. Then they had to come and read it out aloud and there couldn't be any variations in what they said. And there wasn't. Now, it's interesting that in that Old Testament, which is the old, oldest Old Testament, the uh, Old Testament we have in the King James Version is called the Masoretic Old Testament. And it is a thousand years newer 
than the time of Yahawashai himself. So Yahawashai went up, went to heaven, was like, peace, I'm out. And a thousand years after the Masoretics wrote the Old Testament. So which is the most, um, which is the most uh, Old Testament that would be used that, that is more, most accurate? That's the word I was looking for. What's the most accurate? Of the Old Testament, the one that they wrote a thousand years after or the one that was written even before Hamashiach. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go with the Septuagint LXX. And in there, Rome is all throughout that doggone Old Testament. So they have taken their names out of this Masoretic completely, making you think that Rome never even existed in the Old Testament. Now, I'm going to show you, I'm going to just go to, I think I already got it queued up. Just showing you right here of the Jewish dysphoria, um, the, the dispersion of the Israelites or Jews out of their ancestral homeland. But look right here. What did the Romans do to the Jews or Judah? Right here. The Jewish Roman world. We know the word Jewish wasn't there. We know it was Judah. I'm just going to use it. Uh, in the siege of Jerusalem in 70 CE, the Romans destroyed much of the temple in Jerusalem and, according to some accounts, plundered artifacts from the temple, such as the menorah. Now, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to read. Uh, Judea. The name Judea was derived from the kingdom of Judah in the 6th century BCE following the disposition of Herod Archelaus in 6 CE. Judea came under the direct Roman rule, during which time the Roman procurator was given authority to punish by execution. So we keep seeing these Romans and we know the Romans have edited our Bible, the Hebrew Bible, and we know what they have done. Um, anything else? Uh, uh, right here. Why did the Romans destroy the temple in Jerusalem? Model of Herod's temple, the second temple after being rebuilt by Herod. So Herod is building the temple in the Israel um, Museum created in 1966 as part of the Holy Land model of Jerusalem. Much as the Babylonians destroyed the first temple, the Romans destroyed the second temple and Jerusalem in 70 CE as retaliation of an ongoing Jewish revolt. So we see here the Romans destroying the temple. Now, why in the world would you think all of a sudden the Romans would have the word of the most high that he would willingly give it to them and say, I don't want it in the hands of my people anymore. You all tell them how to live and you all tell them the rules and you all you all create these days called holy day or holidays. I'm sorry, holidays. And you all create this uh, days called Easter, Christmas, Valentine's Day, All Saints Day, which is called, uh, which the day before it is, is, is Halloween because it's the day of the hallows. And the next day is All Saints Day where they hallow the saints, which is where you get the Eve of Hallow, Hallow Eve or Halloween. So you all think that he gave them the authority to edit our Bible. No, they just did it because they are and their father or their prince is the prince of Rome, Samael. And he accuses the brethren day and night. And so did his people. 16, 19, transatlantic slave trade. Who brought us over here? The Latins. Who made us forget our name? The Latins or the Romans, however you want to call them. So we got the Latins chilling and, and making packs with the Hamites, the Africans or Canaan, and putting us into slave ships, the accuser of the brethren. And I'm going to show one more scripture. I wasn't even going to go to this, but I think I'm going to go to this. Called, let 
Let me see. So just to clear up if he really wanted the Romans. There it is. Isaiah 65 1. Let's find out because this this is this is the Romans right here. This is the Latin people. Gonna prove it right now. Listen, this is what Yahweh said through the mouth of Isaiah, verse 1. I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. So we know right here, he's not talking about Israel. Let's find out who he's talking about. Verse two, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. It's getting quite clear who he's talking about. Verse three, a people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sanctifieth or that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Uh At the altar incense. Let's just see if I'm. Let's 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 look. Let's click on images. Oh, okay. So they burn incense. Okay, right here. I see incense on altars. Okay, altars. What's that? Let me just zoom in. Oh, altars of brick. Okay, I got it. Okay. Incense, burning incense on altars of bricks. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't going crazy. Yep. Just looking at, okay. Incense on altars of bricks. Got it. Uh, let's see. Verse, let's go to verse three again. A people that provoke me to ang anger continually to my face that sacrifice in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick which remain among the graves. Whew. Who has the biggest saint, such and such, saint, such, such, the graves, the saints, such, such, who remain. Let's see what that word remain is. Who sit among the graves. Oh, yeah. And lodge in the monuments. What? In the tombs. Man, you know, I'm. let me see. In the tombs. Let's Let's just do this. Oh, yep. Royal. Uh-huh. The tombs of the Catholic tombs. Okay. Just want to make sure that I'm I'm getting the same thing. Okay. So, yeah, the Catholics tombs because they built these uh, tombs and different things. Let's see. Tombs. Yep. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Let's see. Let's go back. Uh, verse four, which remains among the graves and lodges and monuments which eat swine's flesh. There we go. We know who eats swine's flesh and who taught us to eat swine's flesh when we came over here to the Americas or the West Indies. And broth of uh, abominable things is in their vessels. So we know who he's talking about now. Which say, stand by thyself. Come not near to me. For I am holier than thou. Oh, we definitely know who we're there talking about now. Okay, we got the right people now. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Wow, let me see. These are, or these cause my wrath to smoke in my nose. A fire burneth all day. Last verse, verse six. Behold, it is written before me. This is what I was trying to get to. I will not keep silence, but I will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. 
We saw where their recompense came in Revelations chapter 18. Verse 4, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sin, that you receive not her plagues. He is coming to recompense those who have accused the brethren, have stolen their Bible, their books, have rewritten them to make a religion called Christianity, a religion out of it. And think that they can get away with it because they have the whole world in their hand. The accuser of the brethren, Satan and his two representatives, Samael, Prince of Rome, Dubael, Prince of Persia. I hope this lesson has taught you a lot about who these characters are, not only who they are, who their representatives are, but also who their people are. So I hope this was helpful. Hope that it edified you and help you get closer toward the truth. And until next time, stay awake, stay reading the word. This is Christians Wake Up and I'm out.